Trump takes pleasure in attracting a stellar list of speakers that address today's most relevant issues. The club's place as a refuge for rich discussion and networking has never wavered after 123 seasons. We are dedicated to encouraging debate on the issues that matter to this city, this province, and this country. The Canadian Club is one of the most important podiums anywhere in the world that a Canadian can speak to, tell Canadians what it is that they think, develop those thoughts. And so I want to thank you for that very, very much. Please join me in thanking our esteemed panelists today. Through our programs and events, including our youth and young leaders programs, our diversity partnerships, our joint events, and our media and social media opportunities, we offer you access to dynamic, political, social, and business figures from abroad and right here at home. The platform from which the eloquence of Canada has flowed all of that time, whether it be business, education, politics, sports, arts and culture. If someone wants to say something to Canadians about this country and about the future of this country, this is the venue you choose. Hello, and thank you for joining me. My name is Anita McCuit, and I am the president of the Canadian Club of Toronto. Happy New Year, everyone. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to our 44th annual Outlook with our event partner, National Post. For those of you that joined last year's Outlook, we apologize. I don't think 2020 turned out exactly the way we planned. We did talk about coronavirus, but I don't think we thought it would end up this way, that's for sure. And I know that we all have questions about what's to come in 2021. Will the market stay strong enough through this post-pandemic recovery? What will a Biden presidency look like? Will we rise to the challenges of climate change? And probably the most pressing question of all, Will we be able to meet in person for next year's Outlook event? Today, our expert panelists are going to look at the predictions that they can make and uh, share their thoughts with us. Before we dive into today's topic, here are a couple tips on how to participate with us. The click here to switch stream button is available to you if you find that your internet is slow. Your video may uh, slow down, but your audio will stay strong. And we do want your questions today. So if you click the questions tab, you can type your question in there and it will go straight to our moderator. Thank you to today's event sponsors, Scotiabank and EY. We could not gather uh, without your generous sponsorship. We are a nonprofit at the Canadian Club and we do depend on sponsors, especially during this virtual environment. Now to introduce today's speakers. Kevin Carmichael is a National Post columnist for the Financial Post. Matt Gurney is a columnist for the National Post. Juliet John is a portfolio manager and founder of Iris Asset Management. Amanda Lang is anchor and reporter for BNN Bloomberg. Jean-Francois Perrault is senior vice president and chief economist for Scotiabank. And today's expert panel will be moderated by Bruce Celery, personal finance journalist and immediate past president of the Canadian Club of Toronto. Now I would like to introduce Marianne Lavallee, executive vice president and chief operating officer for Post Media for some brief remarks. Marianne. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome and happy new year from Post Media and the National Post. We are thrilled to join the Canadian Club at our 44th annual Outlook though this is the first time virtually. Thank you for joining us from across Canada. This event has been a long-standing tradition for the Financial Post, Canada's business voice for over 114 years. Today, Post Media reaches nearly 20 million readers per month. That's 65% of all Canadian adults. We are one of the top ranked networks that Canadians turn to for trusted information and insights. In early June, we launched the Post Media Supports Marketing Grant Program to assist local businesses and the Canadian economy. The program accepted 2,000 applications and provided over $4 million in marketing grants, giving companies a leg up as Canada reopened. 
We continue to leverage our 120 plus brands and our digital platforms to strengthen our communities and help boost economic growth. Recently, we relaunched more than 80 community newspaper websites, bringing loyal readers a richer user experience and closer connections to the communities nearby through news updates from neighboring areas. This past year, Post Media has won more than 30 journalism awards, including longtime investigative reporter Kim Bolin receiving the Canadian Journalism Foundation's Lifetime Achievement Award. These awards are a reminder of the excellent work our journalists do every day and the vital role trusted news plays across Canada. And now to continue our annual tradition, I'd like to share the winner from last year's forecast question. At Outlook 2020, we invited you to predict the closing unemployment rates for Canada and the US. The closing unemployment rate for Canada was 8.5% and the United States was 6.7% as of November 2020. I'm pleased to congratulate our winner, Brian Torrey, who predicted 7.2% for Canada and 4.4% for the US. So he was off by only 1.3% for Canada and 2.3% for the US. And for this year's forecast question, we invite you to make your prediction on the closing price for one share of Tesla for 2021. This year, ballots will be sent to you electronically following today's event. And now I'd like to pass things back to Anita. Thank you, Marianne. One percent on employment is a very large difference, um, but well done. One of the club's traditions that has not changed in our virtual world is the toast that we do to our country before the start of every event. So if you have a drink nearby, a water or coffee, I invite you to raise it to the screen, give a nod and toast Canada. To Canada. Canada. To Canada. With that, Bruce, I will turn the Canadian Club podium over to you. Thank you so much, Anita and Marianne. What a year. What a year. So I have hosted this Financial Outlook thing for a fairly long time. Last year was 43. I watched the tape. Big surprise, no one mentioned the pandemic as a big theme for 2020. Bit of a miss, but uh, when I looked at some of the comments, the single biggest variables that our guests were talking about were relevant and real. It was interest rates, it was geopolitics, it was Iran, it was the United States, what's Trump going to do next, all that. The speaker that I think came closest to calling the year was our newcomer, Matt Gurney. Now, his prediction for the single biggest variable for 2020 was surprise events, which is both brilliant because that's exactly what came to be and also a complete and total cop-out. So good for you, Matt. I think that you could probably use that answer for now until the end of time and just be right every single year. Now, he wins best call. Matt Gurney also wins worst call because he also said, quote, I think we're looking at a, this is on the political front, I think we're looking at a six-month period when nothing happens. Matt, you were not correct on that front. Uh, I begin with the question that I began with last year, and Kevin Carmichael, I'm going to throw this to you first. What is the single biggest variable that you believe will affect the financial, political, and economic outlook in 2021? Kevin. Um, I'm going to go with business investment, uh, not only because I wrote about it today in the, in the post, but um, no, I think that's the, that's, that's the one that'll, that's, that's the one that'll tell us where we're headed, whether we're going to muddle through this thing or whether we might actually grab the wave that we're seeing in a shift to a digital economy and, uh, and surge past where we were before COVID, which is where I think we really need to go. We flatten the COVID curve, we get back to where we were, but back to where we were isn't good enough. I mean, back to where we were is a potential growth rate of around 1.4%, which is frankly terrible. So business when we investment. see business investment coming forward, we're, um, you know, uh, I think uh, you, you need to see businesses uh, make the choice between whether they're going to ride that wave, invest in it, or whether they're just going to sit on their cash pile and um, you know and get by on on what they've got in the bank. Okay, we'll talk more about that as the event proceeds. Matt, in a phrase, what is your single biggest variable you should you believe we should watch in 2021? 
a combination of vaccines and mutations. Uh, we're not going to get on top of this thing unless we get the population vaccinated. I was just doing back and napkin math this morning. At the current rate of things, Ontario would get vaccinated uh, by 2029. I don't say that in a, in a pessimistic way. Like, I actually think, obviously, we are going to scale this thing up. It's just a matter of how quickly we scale it up. We are going to lose people in the next few months. They're going to die because we were slow to get vaccinations started. I don't know how many. I hope it's not a lot. That's going to be a huge issue. Uh, last year, when, when we all met here, we had just seen the, uh, the assassination by U.S. forces of that Iranian general. We were still a couple of days away from the retaliatory ballistic missile strike on U.S. bases. We talked last year about how I, like moments before we went on the stage, I was still looking at my phone to see what else had gone wrong since that morning. And that hasn't changed. We're still living in that. And right now we're looking at this new uh, British variant of uh, COVID. Apparently there's a South African variant, which I've been way too terrified to go look into. Those are the things we're going to have to be watching. First of all, can we vaccinate fast enough? Second, will these vaccines work? If, if, if these are good news, then we'll be okay. If it's bad news, we're going to be doing this virtually for a while. Amanda, for you, single biggest variable. I mean, I hope there's no deduction in points for uh, for the same answer. But when I thought about this, uh, the answer was variants uh, that the that, that the uh, COVID-19 uh, mutates. Uh, the latest mutation from South Africa is terrifying in that it's in the protein and may be beyond us when it comes to vaccines. So to Matt's point, uh, you know, we get to talk about Kevin's problem. Uh, if we can get over this one. Mm. Uh, but this one, I feel like we are, uh, we don't even know what early inning we're in, but it feels like it could be early innings and that's a bit frightening right now. Juliet, for you. For me, it's actually corporate earnings. And so it actually could link back to variants and uh, the coronavirus. However, what we saw through 2020 was that companies really had a very, very difficult time meeting the earnings that they'd put up in the past. What we know is that the market recovery since the bottom in March was really more related to sentiment. It was valuation driven and not corporate earnings. We really need to see if there is going to be the next leg to the expansion that we're in, expansion being uh, share price expansion that is. We need to see it come from earnings. We know interest rates are going to stay low for quite some time. We need the other key variable being earnings to drive that expansion. All right, JF, we'll round it out with uh, your prediction for the single biggest variable to watch in 2021. Well, so it's, it's hard to say anything other than, uh, you know, something related to the virus, but since that's been covered, I will say though, and we're gonna know uh, a lot more about this later on today and over the next few days, um, you know, a really uh, uh, important development as we go forward in the year is what happens with U.S. fiscal policy. And to get a bead on that, you obviously will need to see the results of the Georgia Senate runoffs today and, and when those results come out. That has the potential to, you know, uh, alter the tax landscape in the U.S. quite significantly, has the potential to alter the fiscal landscape quite significantly. And if it matters to the U.S., it matters to the rest of the world, it matters to us. Um, and that, I think, is, I mean, fortunately, we'll get clarity on that pretty soon. Um, but I, I do think that has the potential to, um, you know, shape the uh, way forward in, in quite a substantial way, above and beyond, obviously, the, the variants of the, pen, uh, of the virus and, and anything related to that. Let's start with uh, a, a deeper look at the questions facing the global economy, the Canadian economy, the U.S. economy. JF, you lead with this question about the U.S. What is the best case and worst case uh, on fiscal policy? Well, it's a strange world because it's not clear what the best case is or worst case is yeah. anymore. I mean, there's a period of time where somebody would have said, you know, a $400 billion deficit was was an absolutely terrifying outcome. And, and you know, here we are in Canada. Nobody's really worried about it that much. Same in the U.S. I think, you know, the, the challenge, I think, for policymakers and fiscal or otherwise, you know, really comes back to, um, you know, what happens over the next few months with respect to the virus. I mean, everybody's got in mind that you know, there will be a substantial recovery rebound once we get the virus under control, right? So if you look at a forecast for Canada or the US or other parts of the world, you know, it's really quite robust growth once you kind of go through this period. But you've got to get to that, to that period of time. And, and, and the danger here is um, you know, that you know, following Christmas, you were seeing lockdowns here, there, and everywhere. Quebec might announce a curfew uh, in the next couple of days. 
um, that, you know, the period between now and then is sufficiently traumatic, sufficiently difficult that, you know, the end goal keeps changing and it makes it more difficult to achieve this, 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 this post kind of COVID state of the world where things are going to be substantially better. Um, and that, I think, is, is the real challenge from a policy perspective, including on the fiscal side, right? So right now, markets, markets want governments to spend. You know, they want, you know they're, very, they're very relaxed about it. They understand, as businesses do and as, as individuals do, that governments are there to support. And this is a time of, uh, 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 where support is required. So, you know, if it means that we need to do a little bit more, as, as the Trudeau government has indicated they will, uh, you know, or, or the Biden administration is clearly wanting to do, uh, I, you know, I think in the short run, that's not really a big deal and might help us uh, move forward a little bit more rapidly. But, you know, there is, there will come a time where, you know, hopefully <laughs> in six or seven months, when a lot of this is in the rearview mirror, that we start to think about policy calibration differently. We start to think about how do we unwind some of this stuff? When do we unwind some of this stuff? Nobody's really thinking about that now in the policy world, given where we are, but there will have to be these conversations that take place at some point um, once, uh, once the, you know, the virus is more clearly in the rear view mirror than it is uh, in front of us right now. Amanda, you talk to economists and market watchers all the time on your show, and they really have a global perspective. When you think about this broad question about the economy, what is the most insightful comments you have uh, heard that is counter to this narrative of, don't worry, everybody, there's lots of pent up demand out there. Well, one of the issues is uh, that this may go on longer than that scenario will allow for. So I think everybody agrees that if uh, COVID-19 did what we thought it was going to do and be over early in 2021, there is what the federal government wants us to think of as preloaded stimulus, uh, the money you and I have saved by not parking our cars downtown. Uh, and that's all well and good. But the longer this goes on, we all know, and the economists are, are starting to run the numbers on this, you get permanent damage. A business that closes doesn't just reopen. Somebody else has to come along and get financing and get the wherewithal and get it open again. Uh, so you do get kind of scarring. And I guess the question I would ask, and this is where, I, I mean, I, we could sit around and have a big hate in about uh, mismanagement on various files. But I do think it's not too late to keep pressing, as Mac Ernie does in the paper every day, uh, people in power, uh, where are we on testing and tracing? Why have we given up on that? It's not over. Is there a team in Ottawa right now running scenarios and planning of a second, third, fourth, fifth wave of new variants? Never mind the one we know about. What about the one in South Africa that is immune to the vaccines we have? Uh, I would like to believe that there are people who have the time and the wherewithal to do that. I don't know if it's happening, but to me, you know, the preloaded stimulus only works if this thing goes according to best case scenarios. And I worry about the worst case. Uh, Kevin, I want to pick up on the theme you began with around business investment. We know there's, you know, somewhere around, I don't know, $200 billion if you combine the business and the consumer cash cord out there. You called it, what, the sleeper issue? What is it going to take for businesses, first off, businesses, to spend again? Um, well, I mean, we, we, we spent a lot of time talking about the virus for obvious reasons. So uh, it seems to me that um, what's, going to, what's going to require uh, that business investment surge to come that uh, I guess I'm kind of looking for uh, at the start of the year is for businesses to look past that. I mean, I, I recognize that's very difficult when you've got variants uh, popping up in various corners of the world uh, that, uh, that we don't understand. So that's, that's, that's really scary. Um, and, and scarier, frankly, than uh, I guess the sort of things we were looking at, uh, you know, uh, this time a year ago or, or the last couple of years during the Trump administration, where we were all petrified about trade wars of all things. Well, trade wars don't look very scary now, right? But just the, the prospect of that uncertainty around, around trading rules uh, seemed to shove Canadian business to the sideline. Um, I guess what I, what I think we need to see is just a, a little bit of courage to sort of look through the virus and realize that we're in the middle um, and perhaps even beyond the middle now of, a, of, a, of, a, of one of those shifts like the industrial revolution, sorry, where, you know, technology basically changes everything. And, um, you know, there's lots of money uh, sitting around that can be deployed to make sure that we come out stronger at the other end of this. And so the governments have clearly shown a willingness to do that. The central banks have clearly shown a willingness to, uh, to back up everyone who wants to uh, put some money on the table. Uh, the, the missing piece, I think, at this point is, is business community itself to come forward and say, all right, we're in this too. 
Matt, you follow these political leaders uh, at all levels of government very, very closely. Amanda uh, talked about your coverage, your focus in, on that front. What do you think needs to happen in 2021? We need to get over our consistent and sustained failure of imagination. Uh, as Amanda has said, is there someone planning for the second, third, fourth, fifth waves? I have no doubt there are. I really doubt anyone is listening to them. We had early warning of plenty last year. And the, the public messaging from our federal government, and I, I'm not absolving the provinces, but just to pick on the feds for a minute, was that the risk to Canadians remained low up until, what, about 36 hours before it was everybody panic, get on a plane and come home while you still can. I timed it. It was about 36 hours. And the Canadian public was raiding grocery stores out of uh, toilet paper weeks before the government was willing to admit we were actually heading into a problem. The Prime Minister has now admitted that he was slow to begin surging an effort to get personal protective equipment because it was, I don't know, what do you want to call it? I mean, I've called it a, a failure of imagination. We could also call it normalcy bias. I still think there is this pent-in expectation that we're all just a couple of injections away from getting back to normal, because that is still arguably the most likely outcome here. But the thing is, a year ago, when we were all in a nice hotel, instead of you all looking at me in my basement, the most likely outcome was not that we would find ourselves here now. We have shown that we are incapable of planning for significant downside risk and even less capable of responding to it when it happens. 70% of the vaccine we have received is sitting in freezers while dozens of people are dying in our long-term care homes every day. This is, at a certain point, not a problem of events or circumstances. This is a problem on our end, and we'd better get that fixed. Juliet, I want to round this out with your perspective on the economy. Knowing that you are a bottoms-up stock picker, you're very, very focused on management and metrics and sectors and all those kinds of things, but certainly the overall performance of the economy affects the stocks that you pick. So what's your take on where we are headed from an economic perspective in 2021? Sure. Well, maybe if I might to go back to what Kevin talked about in terms of business investment. And I think that it's really important to also consider some of the flows that have taken place out of Canada in terms of what that means with respect to business investment and just investment in our economy generally. And a lot of it has to do, in my mind, with what's going on in terms of uh, where we see uh, opportunities in Canada, where outside investors see opportunities in Canada. But more, I guess, immediately, what I think is not being talked about enough is the weakening U.S. dollar and what that means to whether it be corporate earnings, again, which is the theme that I started with, but just generally speaking, the ability for Canadian companies to invest. And some of the uh, concerns that we've had over the years, uh, we had Mark Carney talk about it several years ago, is to what extent can companies invest and be original, be imaginative, be creative, and invest for the future. We haven't seen a lot of that in this cycle, and that goes back to Kevin's uh, objective for that to, uh, to come around. And with the weak U.S. dollar, and I, I, I talk about it more in that, uh, in that way than the strong Canadian dollar, but I think that is going to hinder Canadian companies' abilities to invest even further. And so that's a worry to me. And so to what extent that hurts us relative to other markets? JF, I want to ask you to put a fine point on the bank's prediction for the economy in 2021. We've talked a lot about the nuance and the risk factors and all that, but your job is to put a forecast on a piece of paper. What is that forecast? And in a, in a sentence or two, why did you net out there? So we're, we're thinking uh, at present growth around 4.5% in Canada for next year. Oh, sorry, this year. Um, and but that you know that that was forecast done. Uh, actually, we started working on it uh, late last week. But that was pre, you know, additional lockdowns in Quebec and and, and assumption that things were going to start to turn around reasonably quickly. Um, at this point, it's it's you know I, I think four and a half is still a reasonably sound basis for planning, um, but it does imply that the second part of the year. Um, you know, has a vastly improved rate of economic growth than we're going to observe in the first part of the year. There's no question about that. And as others have indicated, if we can't get to a world where, you know, we've got greater control over the virus, 
um, within within a few weeks, then you know forget about a four and a half percent forecast. Like that's just not going to happen. You're going to be you know well below that because you're just starting off the year on a pretty on a pretty treacherous note. Even though there's lots of reasons to think that that you know growth will accelerate. I mean, there's there's this pent up demand issue. You know, there's a lot more stimulus to go out the door. Uh, the U.S. is doing better. China is doing a lot better. I mean, you know, things will 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 kind of coalesce to generate momentum later on in the year. Um, it's just a little bit hard to see that happening now, given how dire the situation is mm-hmm. in terms of uh, the pandemic news cycle. Kevin, I want to include China in this conversation, even though it's not front and center for most of us. I have a Facebook friend who lives in Shanghai, and he's posting these photos of his very normal life at events, in theaters, doing all these sorts of things. And it is both inspiring and also terrifying to see the normalcy that has unfolded there. I mean, for good reason, because their case down is a completely different thing. How do you weave in the question about China's economic performance and trade relationships with them? Yeah, that's a that's a tough one. I've actually been trying to uh, get my head around that one, just how Canada engages with China or just where how China uh, looms over Canada. I mean, obviously, China looms over everyone. So that, that's first uh, first point. I mean, I think, look, we just have to accept that uh, that China is is out of sync with the way we want to live our lives um, here in North America. But at the same time, they're going to go forward and live the lives at least their their government wants to live uh, live the way they 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 they've structured their society in China and they they're pushing ahead and pushing ahead hard. Um, so I think we have to do two things. I mean, I, I hate to keep uh, pounding on business investment, but uh, but if we want to keep pace with China, if we want to stay in the game, then uh, North America, Europe is going to have to uh, be be piling money into research and development and technology. To uh, to be able to compete with China um, in that uh, digital economy that's um, that's well I think frankly that we're now living in um, and the other piece is I think we all know because of the geopolitical considerations that we're not going to be able to engage with China in a in a positive way um, so I think we have to look um, try to go around China if I can put it that way and you look at where China is investing in in the rest of Asia and in the rest of the world and maybe there are ways that Canadian companies can uh, can can you know, latch on to some of that, uh, slip into some of those uh, Chinese powered supply chains, and, and take advantage of, of the growth that that China is going to uh, going to uh, create uh, in Asia. I mean, that's kind of the the, the best uh, best thinking I have about you know China vis a vis Canada at this moment. But uh, but I think it's a mistake to sort of pull back. Um, uh, so we have to get creative about how we're going to engage with the, in a world that, uh, that sees China on top of the mountain along with the U.S. I want to focus on the stock market. I'll use the stock market to broadly include Canada, the U.S., global. And Amanda, I'm going to start with you. How much optimism are you hearing or do you believe has been priced into the market with the S&P 500 trading at something like 22 times earnings versus a historic average of 15? What, what's your sense? All the optimism. There's no optimism <laughs> There's left. No for extra anything optimism. Else. What about I'm in the barn? I'm out surprised back? Santa Claus made the- it to anybody's house this year. Um, I mean, I've watched markets long enough to get to have a kind of a visceral feel about where we are. We're at that part where uh, the dominant players don't want to talk about the the fact that the market's overvalued, and they come up with new and inventive ways to explain why the market's not overvalued. It feels like '99 to me. It feels like 2006 in some ways. Uh, this is just a it's a market that's pricing in the very best case scenario. So uh, ask yourself, if we were, we're sitting here having this conversation, uh, you just heard from one of the best economists in the country, um, that's JF, by the way, that uh, you know, if we don't get this thing under control in a matter of weeks, he's going back to the drawing board on his forecast. Well, if you're the stock market, you're supposed to be pricing in future cash flow, your future portion of earnings growth, uh, however you want to look at it. Uh, things are supposed to grow in order for markets to go up. Uh, so whatever period in the future that they want us to be looking at to justify today's valuations, it should be recalibrating. The one and a half percent move we saw yesterday didn't cut it. Uh, so I, to me, it's a dangerous place to be. It's the only place. It's been the only, uh, you know, there is no alternative situation for years, uh, which is also dangerous. Uh, we could talk about Bitcoin as the absolute, it's the pets.com to me of our current market environment. But it just, to me, there's a very dangerous feeling out there that nobody, re- none of the major players will really address head on. 
Juliet, what do you think? You are someone, you are in fact the only person on this call who is paid and measured by buying, selling, holding, trading stocks. What's your take on the stock market? Well, I have to agree with Amanda. I think that there, uh, pets.com, boy, I think um, that it, there's a lot to take from that. And uh, 20 years ago, that was really the uh, the height of the market. And I would have thought that people would have learned from those lessons, but really we have a very similar situation going on right now. And to me, the market is really two tiered though. We have a lot of companies like the pets.com companies that have been severely overvalued that have been bid up to such an extent that uh, you know, the question even that uh, that the forecast that, that we're supposed to be asking, what is going to be the price of Tesla in a year? That is a fantastic question because who knows? But I think what we've seen now is with its inclusion into the S&P 500, the market concentration that we've had to be concerned about in Canada is being even exacerbated in the U.S. because we've got the FANG stocks already. Now with the addition of Tesla, We've, when we, if we sort of separate out those companies, and I'm talking specifically about the FANGs now, the, um, the year-to-date or the 2020 return, and this is from December 31st to December 31st, excluding the drop uh, into March, we had a return of about 18% for the S&P 500. That drops down to 10% when you exclude those FANG names. So that's Facebook, Alphabet, Amazon, Netflix, uh, I'm forgetting Microsoft and uh, and the like. So that really shows you the extent to which those securities contributed to the return in 2020. So there's a whole other group there of securities that remain undervalued, maybe not undervalued, but fairly valued relative to those overweight consumer uh, discretionary slash technology names that garnered the majority of the attention through 2020. We think there are pockets of opportunity, but the benchmark itself may be a more challenging place to invest. Juliet, you're based in Calgary. You have been there for your entire career. You know this sector well. What are the what are the sub segments of energy that are more appealing? What are the sub sub segments that are less appealing? Sure. Well, I'd say that the energy sector overall, uh, two things. Um, one, most importantly, we need energy. I think um, probably everybody on this panel agrees. And I think that uh, clearly it is um, an, an asset that we require to conduct our daily lives. With respect to investing in the sector, I think what the companies have done incredibly well since the downturn began, I guess six years ago, going on six years ago now, is that they have really right-sized the businesses um, tremendously well, reduced their costs to align with the lower commodity uh, price environment. That said, really, the, the group is quite diverse. You're, you're absolutely right, Bruce. We have the producers on one side, we have some of the infrastructure names on the other, services in between. The producers really are the group where it, it has become more of a challenge. Overall, uh, the S&P, TSX Composite, the uh, energy and uh, exploration production companies now only represent about two, just over 2% of the entire benchmark. So if you're a generalist investor, you could argue that there really is no reason to spend a lot of time focusing on the sector. When we look at how to value the securities within the business, within the um, how do we value the securities, we look at how to discount those cash flows. Amanda uh, touched on some of that. The discount rates continue to escalate within the group because you've got the cost of capital going up on the equity side, the cost of debt going up, which makes a higher denominator, lower present value for those share prices. On the opposite side, we've got the infrastructure names, which actually have done a very good job. They really are the sector or the group within the sector, the industry group that has a lot of value and the assets have significant long-term value given that it's hard to imagine the extent to which additional pipelines and more of the infrastructure type of names will be produced in the future given that the difficulty to get permitting, construction, cost overruns, protests, 
the obstacles in front of any new pipeline development are um, quite significant. Yeah. So that's where we tend to focus more of our attention. Matt, I want to ask you about uh, the Canadian federal political environment today and pointedly ask, will there be another federal election in 2021? You know what? I mean, uh, with so much else that we've said, this is going to hinge on getting the virus under control. And I, I hate to pass on the question, but no politician right now can can dare risk an election. It's not only the political risk, it's literally the public health risk. If we if we try to get organized in church basements and legion halls and community centers, while we're also screaming at people to stay at home, it's not going to work. So there's this inbuilt, inbuilt pressure for not only the government, but also the opposition parties to find a way to keep this going because nobody wants to call the election that 35 days later lands right in the midst of a third wave or, or a fourth wave. So there's gonna be a real moderation. Uh, the other reality it is there's gonna be a reluctance to do this because there's gonna be a, a needed cooling off period before any incumbent government can rest confident that they're not gonna get the blame for thousands of dead people on their watch. So there's gonna be this real desire to keep things battened down for a bit the moment we actually get on top of this thing and we become confident we're on top of this thing, that's when a countdown clock is going to start. Federally, it's a minority government. That countdown clock could be weeks. Like it, it could go as quickly as possible. A lot of the incumbent provincial governments are going to want to run this thing out. Uh, where, where I'm sitting right now in Toronto, uh, we have a provincial government with, you know, two years left on the mandate. We might spend a year getting on top of this thing, which will give the Ford government about a year to then pivot to the people and say, we got you through the crisis and we're the right people to get you through what comes next. So I'd rather have a comfortable majority right now, which is why the BC premier risked everything and ended up getting one, a lucky break for him. Federally, we've got a minority government in the middle of a global catastrophe. We are very highly motivated, all of us, to prevent things from going too weird in Ottawa, at least for the time being. Amanda, a year ago at this event, you talked about electability. And in particular, this was in the context of the uh, choice for a new leader of the federal conservative party. Does Aaron O'Toole have that magical uh, attribute of electability, do you think? Yeah, I mean, in the end, uh, beautifully, the voter will decide. Um, I think what Aaron O'Toole has going for him uh, is he can, to Matt's point, he can stay on the sidelines of a global crisis um, and act as, as he should, a check and a balance and a critic uh, and call the government on things, but not go so far that he forces the, the issue. And I think actually it's, it's worth noting here, I mean, Canada, take away a global pandemic and Canada actually faces one of the most important moments slash crises um, in generations. And that is the fact that our our oil-based, resource-based industries are at a pivot point that we have not seen and did not choose. It's being forced upon us, uh, and how we respond to that will be material. So I would say um, the, the reason I think that what Matt's saying is so important is we don't actually have to have a minority federal government that tiptoes into a March budget. They can actually act a little more de facto like a majority government because they, they have some safety here that nobody wants an election. And I hope they're bold. And I hope they're bold in ways that may not be super popular, uh, may be hard and long term, uh, that aren't flashy and short term job creators, but that actually focus on what we're going to do. What is Alberta going to do, or parts of Saskatchewan, uh, Newfoundland, as we move beyond? And you know, we look at the big oil companies, company after company, writing down the future investment in oil. We better be paying attention to this. So I'm hopeful that we get actual action from the federal government, and they don't have to worry about falling on the March budget. One of the areas that the government has acted on is spending and the stimulus and the supports. JF, every single year, I ask you about deficits. And every year, you are not particularly fussed. And you believe that the electorate isn't so fussed either. We're now hovering around the, what, $400 billion level. Are you fussed yet? No. Uh, and, and markets aren't fussed either. And I, th and I think one of the ways to think about this is to say, you know, uh, is a what if, right? So what if the government had decided not to do anything and ride this thing out? And you can kind of do this counterfactual. And if you do that, you know, and you look at the economic impact that would have occurred, you know, you end up in a situation where the deficit probably would have been roughly where it is now, uh, but with a much less positive, well, positive, which a much less supported economy, right? So kind of the, the worst of both worlds, less growth, more unemployment, 
with a roughly same level of debts and deficits. And that obviously is, is far from ideal. Not that what they've done was perfect, um, but you know, there's this important kind of characterization that you've got to keep in mind that you know, the world would have gone on one way or the other, and it would have been worse than what we've experienced. So that's, I think, very important. And of course, you know, almost even more important is how markets think about these things. It's clearly, you know, it basically is costing nothing to borrow now, very, very little. In real terms, it's negative. So markets are just, you know, there's, there's not really a care in the world on that front. So that gives governments a lot more latitude to move forward with ambitious plans of various sorts. And, and you know, they're doing that here, there, and everywhere. So we're not, we're not alone in that, on, on that side. Um, and so long as uh, markets have the sense that governments are approaching this from a reasonably sensible perspective. And by that, I mean, you know, there will be a plan at some point in time to bring things back to normal, that this is all extraordinary, uh, or that the measures that are being put in place are, are truly measures that are designed to stimulate growth kind of in a long run perspective. So they're not, you know, you're not kind of throwing money down the toilet in the short run. Um, you know, and that's all kind of in place now. And if, and if, and if uh, you know, they manage to keep um, you know, sending the signal that they are truly investing in the country, whether it's on business investment, childcare, a range of things, um, I think they'll have much greater latitude and markets will be much more forgiving than, you know, honestly, what's well, been done in the past. Uh, we're just in, an, in, in, this, in, in a different world now. So I'm hopeful that that message is going to carry through in the next budget. I'm hopeful that markets will see that. They'll be able to, true to his team and, and Minister Freeland will be able to kind of be authoritative and 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 clearly indicate that you know they are very serious about you know fiscal constraints and and, and investing in things that really matter um, and to keep that kind of market confidence and if and if they do that I think I think you know I, I don't think there's a reason to worry at this point in time. Kevin, I want to ask you about climate change in particular, the economics of climate change. The economics, of course, being your prime beat here. What are some of the things that we could see in 2021 uh, on that particular issue? And probably under the assumption that things go well on the vaccine and getting the getting the pandemic under control. Uh, Bruce, people are going to start to think that uh, I set you up just to keep uh, promoting my column from today, but uh, I'm going to come back to business investment again. I mean, the shift to climate change, as Amanda alluded to, is going to require us to do a massive shift to the economy. So I've focused to this point mostly on, on the digital shift. I could have just as easily included climate change, or maybe I should have uh, led with climate change even. But we've got these two forces that are, gonna, that are pushing the economy into the future. Uh, sort of whether we like it or not. So we can choose to sort of ride out the, the carbon economy and muddle along for another couple of decades, or we can choose to go all in, or at least three quarters of the way in, um, on the shift to, uh, to a greener economy, to a clean economy. And I feel like we're going to go pretty close to all in on that shift to, uh, to a greener economy. I mean, obviously there's uh, uh, the, the, the government in Ottawa is, 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 is leaning in that direction. We all know that they, they'd like to go um, in that direction. Uh, if, uh, if the political uh, uh, climate uh, goes the way it uh, goes the way it would like. Uh, but you see the, the bigger uh, oil and gas companies uh, in Alberta uh, finally at least talking like they're serious about it. That's an important shift as well. So, you know, I think it, it could be a positive. It should be a positive. I, I guess I kind of think it will be. Uh, I want to talk about U.S. politics. Matt, you first, Amanda second. Uh, Matt, we are weeks out from inauguration. There continues to be a ridiculous amount of news coming from, or at least catalyzed by, a president who is soon to be out of the White House. How do you read all this stuff? When will the lunacy end? Is it going to be normal come January 21st? No. Um, it's not going to be normal no. for a long, long time. Uh, nothing's happening to the president's Twitter account on January 21st. And we are already seeing something. I mean, it's Bruce, you're talking about a time scale of, uh, of, of weeks here. Let's talk about the next 36 hours. We've got the Georgia elections happening now, and we have in theory, the congressional acceptance of the Electoral College uh, results in favor of President-elect Biden expected tomorrow. And we are seeing an open split in the Republicans about whether or not those results will be accepted. We don't have any idea what's going to happen on that. What we are already seeing, though, is that Donald Trump, the outgoing president, we presume, 
is already exerting a new kind of moral and political power over wayward members of his own party. I mean, he is openly at war with Republicans in the state of Georgia. Like 2020 was a weird year, but I'm still having a hard time wrapping my mind around that as we head into 2021. So even setting aside the emergency we're in right now with the pandemic and the possible geopolitical problems, you know, whether or not uh, we end up seeing some sort of military conflict between the U.S. and Iran, again, in that time scale of days or weeks, let's just assume we get through all of this and things go well. You still have a Republican Party that is not even close to being united right now. You've got an insurgent former president on the outside with a massive social media audience. He may well start his own media venture. He's going to be trying to keep the Republican Party in line, kind of behind what we can generically call Trumpism, long after he's out of office. Meanwhile, the Democrats right now are not really one big happy family either. We know it was remarkable this week to, uh, to see the amount of interest uh, Nancy Pelosi being reelected as Speaker got because it wasn't considered a sure thing. So I'm trying to only worry about seven or eight dire emergencies at a time. And the future of the U.S. politics might be in 10th on that list right now. But in the coming weeks, we're going to have to start paying attention to that again, as as Canadians, as investors, as, as, as financial planners, but also as just citizens of this earth. If the U.S. goes weird, it's a whole new ballgame for all of us. Matt, if you pop a couple of Xanax, you can take it to 12. I think. Well, you know fun. what? I might have to start trying that. <laughs> Medicaid, we'll see how Medicaid, it goes. Take your way to that. Uh, Amanda, what do you think? There is some optimism on the names that are being floated to lead uh, Treasury, to lead Homeland Security. Yeah. There seems to be a good team being assembled. Yeah, I mean, I think I, a, we can all agree that whatever happens, uh, it will be a slightly saner period than the last four years, um, just by definition. And, and I'm hoping that people can't tweet from prison. Um, but... <laughs> Uh, I do believe that the two single biggest issues uh, that face kind of the next decade of political leadership, and that's where the U.S. leadership and role in the world will matter, will be on climate change and on China's role in the world. Those two things will shape how we all live. Um, and it may well be that this, uh, this administration in the U.S. could play a leadership role. Uh, if it can, you know, Biden has shown himself uh, able to negotiate across the aisle. Maybe we see, uh, you know, a more a more formal global agreement on things like cap and trade. Maybe we have pricing mechanisms that actually start to formalize what insurance companies and central banks and bankers have been doing now for a few years, which is informally recognizing the cost of climate change. Uh, when you put a price on that, there's money to be made. So there's value there. I think China is a sleeper issue that's that everybody's awake to, uh, that we are going to, uh, there may be a second Cold War. Uh, do we want Joe Biden leading that? I don't know. Uh, but somebody may have to. So I do think it's super important. I hope Matt's wrong about how tumultuous it is. I hope there's a, I hope it settles fast and that we can get back to the business of governing and leading from the U.S. because they've been missing for a while. We are going to include uh, questions from the audience now. I request of the panelists answers that are in the two to three sentence range so we can get through as many as possible. Matt, this first one's to you. When things go back to normal and we get ready to write history books about this unbelievable time, where will the blame lie? I think that's a great question. We're seeing a lot of it land on China already, um, the, from the China virus on to the continuing coverage just this week about whether or not it popped out of a Chinese uh, laboratory. That's not going away. I think, though, what we need to do, if we're smart, we'll do this. We'll look at our own defenses here. We're never going to stop the next mutated whatever from coming to get us. It's probably not possible in a globalized world. But we can be better prepared at home. We weren't last time. The lessons of SARS were learned and then forgotten. If we do this again, that's our fault. And that's where I hope the blame lies. JF, what is the forecast for inflation? And you can answer that. But the context of the question is, what's up with fixed income? Is there going to be any return there? <laughs> Well, um, it depends on how you define returns, but inflation, I mean, inflation has been stubbornly, um, it's been stubborn around the 2% range in Canada, so slightly below two. It's not come down as much as I think anybody thought. Um, now, folks are starting to think about, you know, inflation rising more rapidly as a result of that and, you know, balance sheet expansion for central banks and worries about all kinds of things. Uh, you know, it's difficult to see inflation picking up very dramatically. And as a result of that, 
um, you know, what you're seeing in, in some of the fixed income markets is this bet that inflation is going to rise reasonably significantly in the next little while, and that's going to force central banks to raise rates more rapidly. It's going to force a more rapid steepening of the yield curve. Um, I, you know, I, I think this yield curve, this, the yield curve will steepen, but it, you know, I don't, I don't think we're looking at any kind of dramatic rise in inflation. And the result of that, you know, we're not going to be, you know, you're not going to be looking at three percent yields on any kind of fixed, fixed income instrument for God knows how long. If, if you know, it's not even foreseeable at this point in time when that might happen. Juliet, for you, consolidation is one of the big themes that people are talking about. We're starting to see it in the cannabis sector. How's that going to affect the banks? This is some pretty sweet uh, fee revenue for them, right? Well, absolutely. And I think uh, the capital markets divisions of the banks are really well positioned to benefit from a wave of consolidation, as are a lot of companies. One of the things that we didn't talk about is the need for scale and that there are several, whether it's in the energy sector or elsewhere, scale has definitely been key. We saw that through 2020 with the largest companies being the ones that were the easiest able to benefit from the coronavirus conditions. But uh, definitely from the bank's perspective, there is absolutely potential for the M&A advisory and uh, just general capital markets fee revenue to benefit from consolidation. And that is one area that I think they'll actually do relatively well in in 2021, whether it be on the wealth management side or uh, on capital markets. The regular banking side of the business is likely to lag a little bit just because interest rates are going to stay so low. So banks that are re uh, reliant on spread revenue could be a little bit more compromised in terms of generating earnings to the same extent. Kevin, for you, one lesson we have learned in the last year is how damaging slow response to events can be. The 21st century belongs to those who are quick and nimble. This uh, questioner comments, can Canada be a leader in event response? Um, maybe. Um, I, I'm going to piggyback on something Matt said. I, I was thinking about as he answered, I mean, and there might, the reason for optimism, I mean, he's right. We do need to focus on, we, we can't worry about China and where this thing started or whatever, that's over. We need to focus on what we can do now in the present to make sure this doesn't happen again. After the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, Canada was among a group of countries that really pushed hard on financial regulation, put a pretty good system in place. And what do we see this time around? Well, the banks have not been a problem. The banks, in fact, have probably been a, a big help. They've been a firewall that uh, has kept this thing from being worse than it could have been, at least on the economic side. So I think there is um, a possibility there for Canada and, and a group of other countries. Obviously, can't, Canada can't do it alone. But we're well placed to, to push hard on getting the, the, a good group of countries together to, to figure out a way, a system that, um, you know, that we're ready for the for the, for the next uh, pandemic, uh, given the, the possibility that we can now accept that this could become a recurrent theme. So I think maybe that's, uh, that's the best uh, answer I have for that question. Qu uh, Amanda, this one's for you. The questioner references a conversation I understand you had with David Dodge, and it includes a part of the economy that we don't talk about often enough, and that is private business, private business here in Canada. Uh, we need it. We need it to create new growth, creative growth, and that the federal government will need to have those businesses back. The question is, do you see that happening? What needs to happen in order for that to happen? I mean, I do, because as we all know, uh, small startup private business is the lifeblood of growth. It's the lifeblood of job creation. Um, it, is, uh, it is as important. We, we tend to overplay actually how important small businesses are, but it is as important as big business. Uh, and I think there's a, uh, there is a willingness on the part of people to put capital at risk. I mean, I think to Kevin's point, we need, we need that energy, but people will do it if they're not stopped. So if we can get the virus under control and get government out of the way wherever possible, it will happen. And I'm always optimistic that there is an entrepreneur willing to put capital at risk if you get out of his way. Or her way. His way or her way. I was using the, uh, the universal his. The universal. All right, we're going to segue to the last word. And so this is a way we finish the event every single year. It is a hope. 
It is a prediction. It is a thought that you just would not feel closure if you did not communicate to our, our audience today. Uh, Jean-Francois, J.F. Perot of Scotiabank, I would like your last word. Well, uh, it's, it's, it's very simple in a sense. I mean, one of the things that has frightened me as we've gone through all of this is the extent to which we, um, uh, you know, an event like this has kind of pulled us apart as opposed to brought us together. And this is true internationally, it's true domestically. Uh, so I hope that as we progress over the next few months that, you know, uh, our experience with the virus and, 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 you know, allows us to come a little bit closer together and, and, you know, see things a little bit more uh, symmetrically than, um, than we have experienced over the last little while. And I think if we did that, we'd be in a much, much better shape to deal with the virus and to deal with the economic challenges that, that, that we face. Kevin Carmichael. Um, my last thought would be to try to, to look past the, the next few months to, to think about what the economy is gonna look like once we finally do wrestle the, the virus uh, to the ground. And I, I don't think there's any reason that we won't do that eventually. It might take a lot longer than, uh, than, than we hope, but I think it will happen. Um, and I think we have, to, we have to recognize that this is a, this is a moment in history. Uh, this is like, as I said earlier, like the Industrial Revolution, technology is going to change everything. And that requires a significant amount of investment at this stage to be able to participate, that, to participate in, that, uh, in that shift. Um, I would prefer, personally prefer as a citizen of this country to be a participant rather than a, than a bystander. Um, and so I think uh, what we need to do, given the weird state of politics in Canada and everywhere, I mean, we, I think we need to work harder on the outside to ensure that our governments are, 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 are looking uh, ahead to these sorts of things, thinking hard about policy, not just throwing money out just because that seems like the right thing to do at the moment and finding a way to do that as, as, uh, as easily as possible or being too conservative or holding back. Um, you know, this, th that thought has been echoed throughout this conversation. I think it's an important one. I think... To, to JF's point, I mean, if the if the, the all the money we're spending, if that's actually used in a way that that uh, that creates economic growth, that is, is hyper focused on that, uh, I think we could come out of this in great shape. But um, you know, but the pol political forces kind of counteract against that. So we need to sort of the, the people on this panel and probably most of the people in the audience sort of need to push back those political forces and and get the people who are in charge of the money, uh, you know. Uh, deploying that all those resources in the right way. Juliet. Well, I would maybe tag on to that and talk about how I think everybody's really stunned and very thrilled at how quickly COVID vaccines and the number of them have come to market, um, given that in the history of vaccine development, it had taken much longer. I think four years was the previous that record. So what I would like to see, and this is more of a long-term global hope, is that there is a renewed interest in development of vaccines. There are a lot of um, diseases out there that are really have been left behind in terms of vaccine development. Right. And I would like to see some renewed effort and investment in some of those areas. Okay, Amanda, for you. I would build on um, Kevin's thought and say yes and. Um, and my and is we need to look forward, and I hope we do. I hope we're nimble and smart. We're fairly well positioned. We need forensics on this thing. Back to that viewer question. Um, where did we go wrong? What do we need to get right? This is not 1945 when it's over. It's 1919. Another one's coming. Uh, let's make sure it doesn't, if we can. Uh, and if we can't, let's go back and look at best practices. I'm, I, I hate to harp on the testing and tracing, but we all kind of say, oh, well, we missed that boat. We didn't, we're still at sea, we need the boat. Let's find it, where is it? Uh, so I, I think we need to figure out not who's to blame, but how we get it right. Right, okay, the last, last, last word before we throw back to Anita is to you, Matt. What is your hope or prediction for 2021? Well, to Amanda referred to the boat there. I just hope it hasn't sunk at sea because that seems to be our luck of late. Um, she, she said something I thought was really intelligent. She said uh, forensics, and that's a, a great way of putting it. I've been saying in all my columns lately, we're going to have report after royal commission after inquiry over the next few years. There's going to be a danger because human psychology is what it is that we're all going to conclude from this. We're going to look at this whole experience and we're conclude we were all right about everything all along. And that's going to be on personal lines, on government lines, on partisan lines, 
all of us have been wrong about some of this. All of us have made mistakes. None of our preconceptions have withstood any of this with 100% accuracy. As we move beyond this, we're going to have to do something we're not good at. We're going to have to admit that the other guy was right about some things sometimes. Right. And if we don't do that, and if we just channel all of this into our normal tribal response, we will not be ready for the next one. And I, I think that would be a shame because having spent all this money and time and having lived in my basement for as long as I have, <laughs> I'd like to think we'd do better next time. I'm not convinced we will because I'm already seeing a hardening of opinions along predictable tribal lines. I was wrong about some of this. Everyone listening to me was wrong about some of this. Right. If we can't admit that to ourselves and each other, we will eventually do this all over again. Kevin, Matt, Juliet, Amanda, JF, thank you so much. It was another extraordinary event and we are headed into another extraordinary year. Though we really don't know what that's gonna mean until we gather again 12 months from now. Anita, back to you. Really can't wait to do this again next year and see what happens. Thank you, Bruce, for your skilled moderation. And to Juliet, Amanda, Matt, Kevin, and JF, thank you for joining us once again and sharing your predictions for the coming year. I think for those of us that don't like uncertainty, myself included, it's a particularly trying time, but it was great to hear some notes of optimism in your comments. And to quote Matt, if we've learned anything from 2020, it's that we might need to have a bit more imagination in our scenario planning for 2021 and beyond. Guests, we hope that you'll join us for some of our upcoming events. Join us next Tuesday, January 12th, when we host Jeff Smith, CEO of Ellis Dawn, to discuss why he thinks fully realized employee capitalism is a key to a prosperous future in a digital world and also the right thing to do. Thank you again to our event partner, National Post, and to EY and Scotiabank for sponsoring today's event. We are grateful for your sponsorship. Thank you to our AV supplier, Van Valkenburg Communications and LiveMeeting.ca for your um, ability to let us gather virtually today. Guests, please stay healthy and stay safe.